Okay, so where we're starting our kind of tour today, we're looking at the rear curtain wall of the castle precinct. And the wall that you're looking at there with the sort of pale distinct you know, limestone stones dates from about 1250. Um, as um, now, when it was built, it stood by the water. The current river fossil you see is a great deal narrower um, than would have been in those days, much narrower watercourse. If you look at the, the map here, you see the grey area by the Blue River is actually the extent of the width of the water. It's all flooded by William the Conqueror. When he first built his castle in 1068, he flooded this side of the city to add a kind of form of protection. So there's no walls here originally. Um, and, the, and the kind of King's Fish Pool is, is the larger kind of grey blob above that. Um, so all that side of the city was flooded. So this here, this Poston Tower, the Poston Gate that you're looking at, was, if you like, the other side of the water. The water would have lapped from the castle wall across this side. So it's greatly narrowed now. And um, so we're looking, obviously, at the uh, the Poston Tower. And Poston basically means side gate. It means a kind of, you know, a not very important kind of gate. Um, and around 1190, a deep ditch was dug from the fish pool around to Fishergate. And the soil was used to build this defensive rampart, which then became the focal point of um, the Poston Tower. So originally, a sort of defensive rampart with a kind of timber palisade, obviously it becomes kind of stone. Um, so this is the second tower on the site. It dates from the beginning of the 15th century. And it's built at the end of the walls and gave protection to the small gate located by it. So I say it means side entrance. Um, but it's got a particular famous exit here that links up to... Uh, the toilet above, so of course going straight down into the water. I'd like to say how disgusting, but now we pump raw sewage back into our, our rivers. I'm not sure everything's changed that much. Um, but it's all kind of rather grand, um, even though there's a much bigger gateway around the corner at Fishergate Bar. When that closed and was, was destroyed in 1489, they had to create a new gateway here. So as you come round, you see this really modest gate. If you look and you see the grooves that are about to kind of appear, you'll see this is where a small portcullis um, was, was in location, so in other words, a gate that could be lifted from above, forward, and down, so a kind of controlled asking, uh, opening. So everything about gates, really, is about control, isn't it? It's about control of who comes in, who goes out, and what you can protect at it. So there's some doors for you, definitely. So Fishergate Poston was kind of round the corner, um, and until 1489, that Poston gate would hardly have been used. Um, but then Fishergate Bar is destroyed. Um, so we're kind of coming round the walls. I was th thinking for, for a moment really about being outside the walls. And what we know is that in about 1244, uh, Henry III um, had rebuilt the wooden Norman castle. So the Norman castle on the hill, the site of Clifford's Tower, as we know, burnt in the Massacre of the Jews in 1190, was built in stone in the middle part of the 13th century. There was a new keep, hall, chapel, prisoners and officers, and now what we call Clifford's Tower. Okay, And the curtain wall was built around it, which we saw a few moments ago. So um, this was, you know, perhaps the city was, was then inspired by King Henry because the city fathers began to do the same to the city walls from about 1250. In other words, creating this stone encircling of the city, replacing the wood and creating a pretty mighty barrier between the city and all comers. Um, and by 1315, this circuit was apparently finished. An attack was then introduced called Muridge. And this was levied by the corporation to fund these expensive works, and it was paid on goods entering the city gates. So we're about to come across the first of our city gates at the moment, which is Fishergate Bar. And this bar originally dates from around 1315, when it was documented as being called Barham Fishergate. Uh, it was bricked up following riots in 1489, but reopened in 1827, so here it is now. So the riots had started in Yorkshire after the new king, Henry VII, the only very good I don't think Leslie, um, introduced a new income tax, you know, chew people off it, introduced taxes. And he did this to support a military campaign of Brittany, so Brittany today in France, they want to remain remain independent of France. Henry thought they'd be a good ally, so consequently, a bit like we're currently supporting the Ukraine, independence push, aren't we? Um, the English sent across £100,000, but this was going to be raised by taxes. And in Yorkshire, this new tax was going to compound it because the harvest the year before had not been good. 
So money was, was very, very tight. See, the Barbican Centre there, named after the Barbican, we've seen in a few minutes. So therefore, even before the tax was introduced, the people of Yorkshire were struggling more than usual. So imposing a new tax on them at this difficult time was considered a kind of step too far. And in addition, other counties in the north were exempt from the tax because it was agreed they needed funds to defend the country if Scotland invaded. So Yorkshire was unhappy these other northern counties had, in effect, got this tax break, but they were not. And it's important to recognise the War of the Roses had only been finished four years earlier. Henry VII, the new Tudor king, didn't really feel secure, especially in the north. And inevitably, York and Yorkshire's support for the House of York in the recent War of the Roses was certainly kind of seen as a grudge factor. So the Yorkshire Rebellion comes right at the end of the period we call medieval. It was an economic rebellion. It's in 1489, and it's against a tax to fund Henry VII's military campaigns. And the people of York were especially upset. Just a quick glimpse over the road here. This has got a certain infamy as at the location of, uh, of Britain's first COVID cases here in York back in March, to whatever it was, 2020, I believe. A tad I'm sure they don't want to remember. but uh, So the people in York were very upset. They had a bad harvest, they are already in trouble, other places had got a tax exemption. So Henry VII is kind of concerned about this rebellion because his position on the throne was still uncertain and he feared that Scotland would join the rebellion to overthrow him. So the rebellion breaks out against the tax, a bit like the poll tax a uh, hundred years earlier. Um, it's unsuccessful, but the rebels did succeed in capturing the city of York and they gained entry by destroying Fishergate Bar, so the bar that we saw about a minute ago. Um, that was completely destroyed by the rebels. And so after the rebellion was put down, Fishergate Bar, that gateway, was bricked up and wouldn't reopen until 1827, which is why then the Poston Gate that we saw a little bit earlier suddenly had a portcullis fitted, because that then became the main entry point on that side of the river. So... You can see as I've kind of walked up here to give you a kind of close-up of the walls that they stand about kind of 12 feet in height the walls but obviously they stand on the mound and the mounds sort of predate the medieval era you are right the way back to the kind of Viking period and the kind of Roman period um, and and so it was felt this kind of was, was needed these kind of gates to protect the gates to exclude um, because Henry VII wasn't the first king to fear attack by the Scots and the kind of substantial rebuilding of the walls that you're looking at here in the gateways in the late 13th and early 14th centuries was a kind of response to the threat of the Scots. It was all about being able to defend ourselves and repel attacks from those north of the border. So the wooden palisades have been kind of replaced with the stone walls that we see today. So timeline-wise, what you're looking at, the gateways, the walls, latter part of the 12th century, of the 13th century, early part of the 14th century. Um, is kind of, so a lot of it done by about 1315, if that kind of works for you as, as kind of date lines. So the medieval city walls originally included four main gateways, or bars as we call them. So Bootham Bar, Monk Bar, Warm Gate Bar, and Micklegate Bar. Uh, there was also six posterns, we've already seen one of the posterns, or secondary gates, and then 44 intermediate towers. So this defensive perimeter stretched over two miles, encompassing the medieval castle and the city. So the best preserved of these medieval gates is Warm Gate. Um, it's the only bar to retain its barbican, which you're going to see in a moment. It's portcullis and inner doors. It's also unique in that it's the only medieval gateway that doesn't sit in the Roman city. Um, so the original gate at Warm Gate dates from the 12th century. And the current inner arch, I'll show you in a minute, um, dates from that period. Most of the gateway that you're looking at right now was constructed in the 14th century uh, and was again badly damaged by fire in the riots of 1489, the rebellion. So the most notable feature here is the Barbican. It's the only Barbican, this is the bit that sticks out from the gate, it's the only Barbican still to exist in England and only one of three in Europe. And a Barbican from the old French meaning Barbican is a fortified outpost or fortified gateway, such as an outer defence perimeter of a city or a castle. Or it could be in a tower, over a gate, or a bridge, which is kind of fortified. And these were defensive purposes. So in the Middle Ages, barbicans were typically situated outside or at the edge of the kind of mainline defences. 
connected to the city walls with a kind of walled road called the Neck. And this would help to defend the entrance by creating a choke point. So what you've got here now is a narrow passageway. If you want to attack these city gates, you've got to funnel yourself into this narrow space. And of course, you can be attacked relentlessly from above. So it makes for a very kind of secure form of kind of gates protection. You know, what you can't do is outflank. You've got to come in into the kind of narrow sort of space. But actually, by the 15th century, kind of improvement in siege tactics and artillery and explosives, Barbican's kind of lost their significance. Now, as I say, there's only one of these in England, which means, of course, the other four gateways in York have already lost theirs. Sadly, in 1825, they were going to pull down because they were kind of in the way. So it's fantastic we've still got one. It has a working portcullis. So as you go up, you'll see the kind of tower where the gateway is kind of wooden iron with spikes that come down. So again, it, this creates a permeability. The city gates can be open, but the portcullis is down. You can, you can pay your taxes. You can establish identity. You can see who's who. So we've got reproduction 15th century doors here. So you can really get a sense of these gates, the mighty gates. Of course, that gateway on the other side not being there. And like a little person gate. Um, and, you know, which I think is, is just so kind of charming. You sort of see the height of it by comparison to the rest of it. It's uh, <clears throat> on the, the inner side, you've then got Elizabethan House up above. And that's support on Roman pillars. So they come from the Roman city. So a nice bit of recycling is kind of going on here. Um, you're looking at Roman pillars supporting Elizabethan house on top of a 14th century um, gateway with a 12th century arch. So make of that what you will. Um, it was a house uh, until 1957, I believe. It's been a police station, I mean, all sorts of things. Otherwise, one of the cats, uh, too far taking the cat tour. Um, but isn't it just marvellous? I mean, the, the whole construction is just fabulous. Of course, the two archways to the right and the left wouldn't have been there in the medieval period. But let's think now about kind of passing into the city. We are a medieval visitor. We've come to York, the second city of England. As we pass through this gateway, we're entering into um, one gate. Um, and sort of by contrast to the northern side of the city, this is the only bit of the city that wasn't on the location of any gate, that wasn't on the location of a Roman gateway. Because this street, Warm Gate, lay outside the Roman settlement of Ibrahim. Um, there's a Roman road across it further up at the top, um, but there's very limited evidence of kind of occupation by Romans. Um, it appears to have developed during, during the Viking period, um, and it was kind of mostly industrial and kind of commercial users. The first reference we get of it is around 1080, called Walbgate, suggesting it may be named after a person, Walba. So Wormgate Bar at the southeast was built before 1155, but that section of city walls, enclosing the street, wasn't built and finished till 1267. So, you know, it's built at different kind of stages. It's not until 1505 that what you saw there was fully complete. Um, the, it was a kind of very important tree by 1200. It was uh, a four church, St. Denis, St. Margaret, St. Mary, St. Peter of Willows, um, of which the first two still survive. This is Bosemarell House. Um, and Elizabeth Bowes Lyon, who was the late Her Majesty the Queen Mother, it's her family, same relation. This is one of four houses uh, which a license was granted in 1396 to construct in the churchyard of St. Peter Le Willows. It may have been a vicarage for the church, or alternative for St. Margaret's. In later years, it was a cheap lodging house for travelling work workers. And originally, it was an L shaped frame that the side extension was put on a uh, sort of century later. Um, and so it's kind of unique. There's no other house in the city sort of quite like it. It's about 20 feet long and 10 and a half feet wide, the kind of the L shape. Would have been a very impressive building, highlighting York's wealth and importance on arrival. Now, if you look at these buildings on the right hand side, the footprint was established all the way back in the medieval era because these were the major houses. Houses are very wealthy. The Percy's and the Neville's had houses down here. There's a sea fish and shellfish market held in the street in the medieval period that would have created a really kind of vibrant buzz. Um, and so we know this was an affluent area, an important area. Um, the gateway just on the kind of right-hand side, you sort of see some, some, some black uh, gates uh, momentarily there. The way to St. Margaret's Church. This was an area of fullers. So fulling, um, York's economy was very much based on cloth and textiles. And fulling, which is also known as tucking or walking, is um, preparing uh, wool and cloth making. And it involves the cleansing of wool and cloth, particularly wool, um, to eliminate lan lanolin, oils, dirt, other impurities, 
and to make it kind of shrink by friction and pressure, sort of felting, if you know, felting. Uh, and urine was very important, so the Fullers collected urine. This, by the way, is 77 uh, Wormgate, another 15th century property, so it's nice just picking out for you the kind of medieval properties that would have been visible, that are encountered the visitor at the time. So the Fullers uh, literally collected urine, the still urine was used in the preparation of cloth, and once they'd been washed, although it would stink, absolutely lit, Fullers Earth comes a little bit later on, um, that's kind of clay and stuff, so that kind of replaced the, the, the use of urine, which annoyed people greatly because they used to sell the urine to the Fullers. Um, which is the, 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 the phrase taking the piss comes from, in other words, stealing somebody's urine. Uh, it, it was so valuable, actually, in ancient Rome, urine was taxed. Um, but Leslie's absolutely correct, full as earth kind of replaced it, which is kind of like a stone compound, which again pulls out all the kind of nasties from wool. And then when you've done that, what you'd then do, so this was the activity in this area, they'd stretch out um, the, 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 the textile on a frame attached by tent hooks, you know, to, to be on tent hooks, so it comes from, and then she beat it. And in beating it, it would kind of condense it, push it together. It's like felting. But it would also then create like a bond, almost like a Velcro, um, like, you know, a, a hook type situation. It becomes so dense and matted together um, that it becomes waterproof as well. So it's a, kind of, it's a really kind of solid process. That was what was kind of done in this area. Um, so felting um, is kind of known as. Um, so this is St. Denis Church. It would have been an incredibly important an impressive church in the medieval era. It's a great deal smaller now than it once was. And the reason for that is when the King's Fish Pool, the large body of water that William the Conqueror created, when that was drained in the 16th century, it basically collapsed the foundations of this church. So a large part of it kind of fell away. So it's a much, much smaller church than it is today. But it's absolutely stunning. It's got some of the oldest medieval stained glass anywhere in York, named after the Penitentiary of France, St. Denis. Um, we, it may well have been the site of a Roman uh, temple. Absolutely, we know it's a Saxon church here. There is a wonderful uh, gateway. So, so if he and Braisby was here, he would be uh, having kittens. He'd be, he'd be absolutely getting really excited about the Norman doorway here. Interesting, I mentioned that there's a kind of shellfish um, market. And the, if you look on the first on the right-hand side, you'll see a shell. Um, which may relate to that, but equally it may well relate to um, the, the Spanish um, pilgrimage, Compostela, um, you know, Santiago and so forth, because that is the, the symbol of that pilgrimage, is the shell. Um, it's absolutely beautiful sort of church. Um, and if you notice, we go out, the, the high walled uh, cemetery, like most of York's medieval churches, the, the, the churchyards were, were closed many, many years ago because they're full of bodies, so you get these very high walls. But the most famous person to be buried in that church is a very important medieval figure whose name was Henry Percy. He was the third all Earl of Northumberland. And the Percy family were again leading landowners in Northern England. Um, and the fact that the Percys had a house in Warmgate uh, and he's buried here demonstrate the kind of prestige in the medieval period. However, his association with York didn't direct his loyalties. Um, and at the outbreak of the War of the Roses, he kind of followed his father to become an ardent supporter of the Lancastrian cause. His father died at what's considered to be kind of the first battle of the wars, St Albans, in 1455. So at that point then, Percy becomes the third Earl of Northumberland. Um, and he met his end six years later when he commanded the Lancastrian archers, who were blinded by the blizzard of the Battle of Towton in 1461, the bloodiest battle in English world. There's been a lot of the Towton tour with me, will remember. So he was the commander of that day. So he died on the battlefield, but he didn't have much of a journey back. A few miles, he was back to York, and he's buried there uh, in, in Wonga in St Denny's Church. So a lovely sort of sight. I don't think I've taken you um, on any of the kind of tours so far. That's the nice thing about doing this. He's just always trying to think about showing you different bits of York. So we're still following this route in. We're following the route that, that our, our medieval traveller uh, would, have, would, have, would, have, would have taken coming in from Booth and Bar, having paid his mewerage, his tax to enter in, um, and we're making our way up towards um, the city. And by this stage he may well be thirsty, he's thinking it's time for, for a drink for a hostelry. Um, and he may well have looked and thought, you know, the finest of the inns around here is the red line we're about to see on the kind of left-hand side, but actually didn't open as a pub until um, the 19th century. It's rather cheekily claims to be the oldest pub in the city, but it does so on the basis that in the front bar, 
there is um, a 13th century bread oven. And so consequently, that makes it the oldest building that hosts a pub, if that kind of makes sense, uh, rather than being a pub that's constantly traded since that period. And it looks like it's actually on a different street. It looks like it's on Merchant Gate. But what this is, is quite typically a lot of these street, a lot of this building in the medieval era, you went down a passageway to encounter it. So what, what's been lost, if you like, is the front section of it. So they were set back. Um, from the street so we've seen a few houses like this in York very very typical kind of building if you had money you moved away from the street scene it was noisy it was smelly okay you didn't want the hassle of the street scene so houses were kind of set back so that's why it looks like it's on a different street that's merchant gates but that didn't really exist in the medieval period so back now into Fosgate we're about to kind of cross over the river Foss and another great building of course that we're about to pass on our left hand side is also kind of set back from the road and that is the Merchant Taylor, the Merchant Adventures Hall. Um, <coughs> I'm just going to drink a little bit of thirsty. So we're crossing over the River Foss. Unfortunately, rather, rather full of duckweed. So um, the Merchant Adventures Hall. We're about to pass the gateway on our left hand side. I hoped it was open to go into, but it was closed at the time, so I couldn't kind of take you in to get the view. Um, We've talked a bit about the, the guild of uh, Merchant Adventurers before. Um, you'll see in a moment their crest above the door. And the text at times can be kind of hard to read. But what it actually um, translates as is God give us good fortune. God give us good fortune. So this metal sign coming up here, hanging down. This is the, the flag and the emblem of the company of Merchant Tailors. Their hall is behind that red door. So you see the sign there. So translation from the Latin, God give us good fortune. And they largely made their income from exporting cloth to Northern Europe and importing luxury goods. So they were defining what sorts of goods would have been available in medieval York, whether that be importing uh, wine from France, whether it be importing foodstuffs, luxury goods, uh, kind of consumables and so forth. They were defining what was available because they were the main sort of exporters. Um, and there were one of kind of two dozen trade guilds um, in the city. So if our medieval traveller that arrived had kind of thought, well, maybe I'll stick around in York, what he's going to have to do very early on is encounter the trade guilds because they are in charge of the merchant community. They do everything from training, apprenticeships, they set prices, quality standards, they do the deal in each area of business. So these guys would do obviously shipping and trade, we had companies of butchers, of tailors, of shipbuilders, you name it. There are these all, all these kind of different um, you know, metal workers and so forth. So whatever trade you wanted to be in, you have to demonstrate to the guild that you had um, the qualities, the training. Um, otherwise, you'd be a labourer and the training is going to start all over again. So the, the, they held a very, very kind of tight grip. Um, the guilds, uh, and this is long for kind of local government, it was the trade guilds that controlled life in the city. So we're now passing the Church of St Crooks, um, or re the rebuilt Church of St Crooks. The Church of St Crooks originally dates from the early part of the 14th century, and um, it's one of a cluster of churches very kind of nearby here. Uh, you might have just very briefly glanced the the, the, the Lantern Tower of All Saints Pavement behind us, or rather on the right-hand side, St. Saviour's Church. Um, and these churches were clustered, there were so many of them, because most of them originally were monastic, thank you, Leslie, um, in, in their origins. And York had an exceptionally high footfall, because one of the main reasons people come to visit and they pass through the gateways into the city was on pilgrimages. So pilgrimages were a major, major element of medieval life. And it's what would take people on the holidays. Holidays, what's it come from? Holy days. Think about it. Holidays, holy days. Same word, right? So when people come into York for the most part, when they're arriving here, when they're, when they're kind of coming through the gateways, it's for a religious purpose. So within the churches, of which there are 40 religious houses in the city centre, they're going to see relics, they're going to pray, they're going to see shrines. So York, if you like, offered a wide array of um, of these religious experiences. And so all the major, uh, you know, 
monastic branches, Dominicans, Benedictines, Carmelites, Augustinians, Franciscans, they're all here and they've all got their focal point and it's all of course about hooking in the patrons, getting people to be sympathetic to their cause, leaving behind benefices, because at this time of course, to the medieval mindset, the best way to get your place in heaven is of course to uh, to help the church, support the church. So we're moving up now, to coming up towards Booth and Bar, just briefly a little foray into Goodrum Gate, just to, uh, to eat and wet your appetite with a York Roast Company, fantastic Yorkie puds. Um, but kind of Goodrum Gate running off to the left hand side there, sorry, the right hand side. But we're going to follow up uh, Peter Gate. So we're still following, but now what we're joining is the Roman Road. So of course the Roman Road still running, which you use today, was the main thoroughfare of the medieval city. The Yorkie put right there. Um, so the Romans had created this, is the Via Principia. The main route through the city was still the main route that was being utilised in the medieval era, still being used today, of course. So we're working up now towards Booth and Bar. Leslie had lunch at the Yorkie Pub. Hope you had a great time there. And uh, so St Peter is is very much uh, is named, of course, after St Peter, to whom the minster is is kind of dedicated. Um, and again, we're seeing a street scene, largely kind of undisturbed, that our ancestors, our predecessors, would have recognised. So York, just to kind of put it in context by the kind of the height of the kind of Middle Ages period, the medieval period, was the second largest city in England. But population-wise, um, it was only about 15,000. London was the runaway winner. London had a population of about 100,000. So no less he's on from London, it's probably 8 million now, something ridiculous. So about 100,000. Um, York second, Norwich probably third, maybe about 12,000, somewhere in that kind of region. So that gives you a sense, really, of... The size, so when people come and they visit York and they experience it, and there is how compact and small it is, bear in mind that the original city within the walls was only really about accommodating kind of 15,000 people. So, you know, what we now think of in terms of a city is really, this was the population of a kind of pretty small town, really, uh, or a small town English standards. Um, so... If you sort of think, well, York is so small, and, and part of the reason I want to do this tour and do it in an hour is to show you actually how close everything is together, because I think that's the problem with edited videos, and you can see this, I've, I've run the whole thing through. Um, this, by the way, is the other stone gate, which we don't go down on this uh, today, is um, the Via Pretorius, that's the other Roman avenue. So again, two, the Via Principia running down Petergate, the Via Pretoria running up towards St. Helens Square. So we're continuing on now towards the northern gateway of the city. And again, we've got these very, very distinctive sort of medieval buildings. Um, it is a lovely, beautiful street, Elizabeth. So this is sort of Peter Gate that runs, to say, from, from the top of Booth and Bar to King's Square, where we kind of find the shambles, uh, the Cat and Gallery, absolutely. And hopefully by now you're recognising the so Michael of Belfry Church, where, of course, Guy Fawkes is going to baptise. Um, but I want to kind of show you how close this is and how flat it is, so that even if you're... Not brilliant. You don't have to do it now. You can spend a day doing this. But I want you to see that it's doable. That York is, is not a place that is difficult or challenging, even if you've got limited, or if you want to you know, hire a scooter for the afternoon. You know, that's perfectly plausible. You're still going to get to see most places. All right, you can't go to the top of the tower, but you know, to be frank, I don't want to go to the top of the Minster Tower either. Um, but we'll get some nice views. We're going to go up on the walls in a few minutes, and we'll have a look at the kind of Minster from there. So we cut across now. Dean Gate, which didn't exist in the medieval period. There have been rows of houses all the way here. And we're coming into High Peter Gate now. So the top end of Peter Gate, and we're walking up towards Bootham Bar. And Bootham Bar, um, I've started many a tour here over the years. Um, but I've always started from the other side. It, I think this is maybe the first time on one of these tours we've actually approached it from this side. Uh, and kind of come in and, and kind of gone around the other side. And I think it really gives you a sense, when you see this visual, visual here, of quite how the walls create this enveloping sense that when this tight-knit medieval city was kind of constructed, it must have felt like a little village interwoven. Again, fantastic 15th century buildings were so fortunate in terms of the sheer number of them. Many of these, of course, now um, 
our, our shops originally would have been hospitality. By the gateways, people are arriving, they've done a long journey, what do they want? They want something to drink, something to eat, possibly stay with the horses, they want a comfortable bed. So many of these buildings, okay, would have been uh, involved in kind of hospitality. And many still are, obviously, there's various kind of pubs here, the hole in the wall, famously, um, one of them. Like to live on the left, it's, it's rather a fetching, isn't it, uh, Elizabeth? So this is Booth and Bar, and it's a very different proposition to um, to Walmart Bar. For a start, the Barbican has gone, so I wanted to get a mental picture now of that Barbican that you saw at Walmart, the long stretchy out bit at the front. That should have been here. It was taken down in 1825. They're going to take all the walls down. They didn't. I'll tell you about that in a minute. But you'll see here the portcullis. So again, um, the gateway that can come down, hopefully on top of that car, shouldn't have been there. Um, and uh, so what that will enable you to do is obviously have the city gates open, but your portcullis down. So you can converse through it, you can see through it, you can find out people's credentials, look at the papers. But it's a good deal more solid. It's the, it's the, it's the, the, the kind of pit bull. It, it's, it's, the, it's the really solid gateway, this one. These statues, by the way, um, are a Victorian edition. Um, they portray uh, a 14th century knight, the Lord Mayor, and the architect. They are Victorian flourish. But this gateway was designed to withstand attack because we're on the northern side of the city. This archway here that you're looking at here is Norman. It's the oldest part of the gateway. The rest of it, like everything else, is 14th century. The first part of um, the 14th century was largely rebuilt after the Battle of Mighton in 1319. So it's all about Scots aggression. We're precisely on the site of the... Um, uh, there may be part of uh, in, in Luz, I'm not sure that, but officially the, 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 there's only three in Europe. There's one in Dijon in France, one in Krakow, which I'm sure you've seen with, with August to us, and one here in York. So there may be a fragment of it, but, but this is the only extant. Um, um, so when we look out and down, um, we're looking on the Great North Road. In a minute you're going to see through as we kind of come into... Um, so the fortified chamber here. So this is a guard house that we're into, into now. That's been kind of built to dominate, to defend. So you can see the upper part now of the kind of portcullis that can come down on chains and close off the entrance. And these two windows, probably the light was slightly too bright. You can't really see, but they are very directly orientated. So you're looking out onto the Great North Road. You're looking out towards Scotland. So if a raiding party was coming, this is the route that comes. You'll see steps up now. Obviously, the roof's been put on, but steps would take you up to the top. So you've got absolutely fantastic vantage points. So the whole thing was designed to withstand attack. Um, and you've even got, weirdly, arrow slits to fire into the city. We don't really know whether they are Victorian flourishes or original. It seems it's slightly odd, but we don't entirely know. Look at my shadow there. Um, so coming out now actually onto the walls, I thought we would see, you know, give us a kind of view on the other side. So I mentioned that the, the Barbicans were taken down in 1825. So that is the outer part of the gateways. And they were going to get rid of all the gateways. So the focus is tours about gates and arrival and coming in and protection. Cure boy, oh, actually. Um, so why would you want to get rid of the gateways? Well, the answer is, is they were in a pretty poor, thank you very much, Elizabeth. They were in a very poor state. Um, during the English Civil War in the 17th century, they'd been hammered by cannon. And of course, the arrival of cannon and the kind of gunpowder and ammunition sort of spelt the end of, of stone fortifications because they're going to end up collapsing on you and, and doing more harm to you than you do to anybody else. Um, so consequently, sort of stone protection was sort of went out of fashion. Um, but they were in a very poor state of affairs. They were falling down. And also, the Industrial Revolution meant that in lots of towns and cities, the walls just got in the way. What they wanted was big, wide avenues and ways of getting raw materials in and finished goods out. And, of course, narrow gateways, particularly these barbicans, they just a nuisance, right? And so commerce would whinge and moan and get what they wanted. And so in London, in Newcastle, in Edinburgh, all these places, the city walls were taken down. Little fragments remain. You might have seen in London by the barbican and down by the Old Bailey. There's a bit of wall there, but for the most part, it's all gone. York was different. And the reason why is that York didn't really have a industrial boom um it was a, it went through a long period of kind of economic decline but then as it began to come out of this in the middle part of the 19th century two lucky things happened for york one was the arrival of the railways 
which gave it a massive kind of shot in the arm, suddenly kind of domestic tourism was sort of possible. And secondly, the kind of romantics had discovered York and the romantics, of course, were in love. They sort of hated the Industrial Revolution. They were in love with um, the idea of kind of chivalry, weren't they? And kind of romantic love and the stories of, 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 of Robin Hood and Maid Marian of um, what, 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 what's it called? King Arthur, Guinevere, Sir Lancelot, that weird little menage to our kind of going on. And so, you know, they wanted to kind of dress up and put the, put the little wimples on and, and come and sort of play in York. And so, you know, it provided a backdrop and like an antidote to, to, the, to the bleak industrial landscape of the North. York wasn't like that. So when the, the corporation tried to modernise York and say, well, let's just get rid of these walls, they're a mess, no one else has got them, they're falling down. The Romantics said, no way, you're not doing that. And so actually a, um, a, a weird combination of... William Etty, who was, was a very famous painter of nudes, a royal academian, and uh, Sir Walter Scott. Uh, you might have been on, on Edinburgh tours with Sam or Paul, or Martin even, um, and, and the Walter Scott Memorial there on, on, on Princess Street, which is the same guy, the same guy. Um, and they felt that York was a special case. It needed protecting for itself. And so they undertook um, a campaign, and they started the first ever uh, sponsored walk, we believe, from Edinburgh, down to London, raising funds, raising awareness, and eventually went to see um, George III. Now, George III, of course, famous he was, the Mad King. Um, so they may be on to a winner with that. But they persuaded him that uh, the request made by York Corporation was out of order. The, the, they weren't to take down the walls. They should, in fact, restore them. The King agreed, and so York were told, not only can you not take down the walls, you've got to rebuild them, you've got to make them good. And so what you're looking at here is a, a rebuilding, and to a certain degree, a Victorian reimagining. This we're looking at across, by the way, is across the Lord Mayor's Walk. Um, you see the moat running kind of down the bottom, uh, <clears throat> because of course, again, it was surrounded by water, or actually on this side, it was surrounded by sewage. So if you wanted to, to attack the walls, you had to wade through a river of sewage. I think that would uh, that would give you something to think about. Um, in a freezing cold river of shit is not really what you, sorry, excuse me, is not really uh, that kind of tempting, is it? But as I say, um, the uh, the structure you're looking at was rebuilt. That's um, St John's University, where my uh, my nephew uh, has, has just started uh, doing a design course. So we wish him well. Lovely to have him in York for three years. Um, great place to study. Um, but part of the um, the rebuilding that the Victorians did, put, they put in flourishes, should we put it that way, little touches, things that really have no place uh, in a defensive system. Um, so the next bit of tower that we're going to see here, there, here we are, that's folly. That's just the Victorians going, so cute, so cool, let's build it like that. It looks like something from a kind of fairy tale. And so there's, to a degree, there's some kind of indulgence kind of going on. I don't know quite what they were knocking down that day, but it's good to see because it reminds you that York is always changing. We just have to focus on the bits that haven't changed for centuries. But of course, like any anyway, race, a city in flux. Um, so the Victorians couldn't resist adding a few of the little flourishes. So what we're looking at, obviously, is taking it all the way back, Roman walls, you know, then taken over and rebuilt by the Vikings as wooden palisades. Okay, so the, the Roman stone walls right at the bottom layer. Then the Viking palisades lifted up by, by the Normans and then from the 13th century onwards rebuilt in stone. So we've got three or four sets of city defences that all come together. But what we know about this particular line is it follows precisely the line of the Roman fortress. And of course, it gives us this fabulous view of you know, the medieval minster. And of course, the minster is the most famous. So anybody, of course, coming in the medieval era as today, um, will be confronted by the sheer majesty of it. And I think there's no better place than the walls to get a sense of the Minster. On the ground floor, it's amazing, it's immense, it's kind of overpowering, but to actually take in the dimensions, the shape and how it dominates the rest of the city, 
there's nothing like this vantage point at the walls. I think it gives us a really kind of fantastic way of seeing and kind of appreciating it. A little bit later on, I'll kind of walk past it and you'll sort of see it at its enormity. But I think it's kind of helpful at times to sort of see it from this vista where you can almost make eye contact with it and kind of process. It's like something that's lined from outer space. So, you know, we are processed to think about large buildings, whether it be skyscrapers or, or pyramids or the Great Wall of China or whatever it is, World Trade Centers have gone, you know. But imagine if you were living in the medieval era, you're coming here, let's say you're a child, you, you, you're coming here with your mum and dad on a pilgrimage. You live in a, in a farming hamlet. You know, every way, all the buildings that you've seen are single story. Remember the Lord of the Manor's got a two story house. But mostly it's single story, dark. There's no light, there's no windows. The only fire you get is from smoke, it's from fires. And it is smoking, right? Smoky. Then you go and you, you see the Minter Tower above you. And it makes you feel tiny and insignificant. And then you pass within and you see light and colour and decoration. And it was just blown people away. I mean, it's pretty amazing now, I'm not going to lie. But imagine if you'd never seen a big building before in your entire life. And that's the first result. So we're at Monk Bar now. So we're at the third of our main gateways. And these chaps up here, again Victorian, but they're reminding they are the men of the murder holes who were there to drop rocks upon you. So again, when we look at this, you've got to remember there was a barbican there. He's been taken away. So thankfully, um, the walls were rebuilt, but unfortunately three barbicans had already been taken down, which is why we've got denuded ones. Now this often, I can't show you too well the thing, but I love going down here. The internet signal is rubbish. So this may be the first time you've seen this clearly. And this gateway was designed to be defendable on every single level, including if it was invaded the staircase, you could kick him down the stairs. Okay, and it's done so a right-hand person could not swing the sword. A right-handed person would whack their fist straight into the wall. So we're coming underneath uh, Monk Bar. They're really clever. They really thought of these things. Um, so we see the wonderful vaulting. Again, you've got the portcullis. So the gateway that you're going to come down, that can control access. So this is the largest, the most decorative of the gateways uh, in York. Monk Bar was sort of substantially rebuilt um, with money from the Duke of Gloucester, King Richard III, um, who was a great patron of York. And to my money, it is far away the nicest. The barbican probably would have come up to about where we're stood right now, that kind of line. And you see the two doors about a third of the way up at either side, they would be the walkways out onto um, the high walls. So imagine, think about Warmgate, that would have been there too. What we've got in addition is what they call murder holes. So if you look, if you sort of see the four cross pieces, the four arrow slots, and that kind of gothic arch above, if we look up between the wall and those arches, there are what they call murder holes. And so the guys standing on the top could be dropping down heavy stones or oil or hot water. So again, into the barbican. Imagine you're trapped in there. You know, so again, very much is a hot sand. There's a whole bunch of things you could do, hot gravel, to sort of help kind of defend the city. Now, I remember at this point, I'm thinking, right, I've done three tours, uh, three, three of the bars. Uh, I'm on kind of, four, I think I was 43 minutes in. Well, I know I'm from watching the video. Uh, I'm thinking... Am I going to make it to Micklegate in uh, in 17 minutes? Um, and those that, that know the route and know where I am and know where Micklegate is, you will know that that is not an easy stretch. But I promise you, none of this is speeded up. None of this is edited. Um, and I set out on my challenge to make it to, to kind of Micklegate uh, to see if I could do the thing within an hour. So we are now coming on uh, Goodrum Gate. So again, imagine this is one of the medieval thoroughfares. Again, lots and lots of, of, of medieval properties to, to kind of give us the sense. And we're very, very near, of course, now the Minster. So this was an area where you would have seen large numbers of men um, in clerical garb, in, in investments. You'd be mulling around lots and lots of people in holy orders. The actual, the precinct of the Minster, the area surrounding the Minster was surrounded by walls. And the reason for that was you controlled the entry. All the way back to the kind of Viking era, they knew they had to control access to churches. There'd been too many raids, they lost too many valuables. They kind of learnt their lesson. And so consequently, it controlled access. You had gateways. And you had to kind of pay your way in 
or make sure that you're kind of had a legitimate business. So this black and white building here is the one surviving gateway of the Minster Precinct. Um, so it dates again from the, fourth, from the 15th century, the early part of the 15th century. Wonderful building. Um, built to the National Trust, you can stay in it if you've got very deep pockets indeed. As we come in, come in close, we can see where the gates hung, see the, 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 the marks, the hinges there. Um, one of my favourite little bits of York is absolutely kind of delightful. Um, so there have been four of these originally, the four gateways of the Minster Precinct, and the kind of route that we're going to sort of follow down here, um, largely not down Goodwin, I'm just going to have a little nosy to see what's down there, um, is, is basically the line of the wall. So whilst it's a kind of contemporary wall, you see the brick pillars either side here, this essentially still creates the sense of the Minster Precinct. And the Minster Precinct was their kind of self-governing area. They had their own, still do actually, still uh, their own police force, um, their own uh, kind of laws, courts, you name it. So, so like the Vatican in Rome, it was a kind of mini city within a city. Um, and it's still got that. The, 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 the Minster Precinct is still a distinct area that is only really theoretically controlled by the council. In reality, they've got their own kind of good, good governance structure. So the Victorian wall on the kind of right-hand side is in effect mirroring the old kind of precinct wall. But from this part onwards, the wall has been taken away, so we now get sort of full views from the south transfer on the south, per, south esplanade, south parade of the Minster. So again, you can only imagine now, as we, as we walk past it, and, and obviously for those that haven't been, as humans come in, that they work as jolly good scale meters. You know, look at the size of this place. It absolutely towers above us. And this was the point. In this medieval mindset, the idea they wanted to create when they built these enormous edifices was to make you feel small. This was a society, this medieval society, that was entirely run and organised by the church. And it was based on rules, following rules, not questioning, doing as you're told. You're not meant to understand it, it wasn't even in English, it was in Latin. So this is the Minster Gates, by the way. So this is the kind of third of the Minster Gateways. So it still exists as a street, with a physical gate no longer there. There's a kind of street sign up on there talking about the Minster Gates. This street was one time known as Bookbinders Alley, which I think is a lovely name, um, because it was an area of printing and publishing. Um, largely originally to do with the church, because they loved um, getting income from souvenirs. I've been to the shrine of St William at York, boom, and that was, um, you know, kind of woodcut printing. They suddenly got less keen on printing when, when actually typeset printing came in, because obviously people then start thinking of their own ideas and writing them down and circulating them, they didn't like that at all. Um, but initially, the church was very keen. So all this area was sort of printing, sort of publishing in the medieval period. So we're into Stonegate now. So Stonegate, um, the Via Pretoria, so Roman Road, the first of the, the main roads that we think in York to have been paved. So again, for medieval visitors coming here, this is encountering, this building on the left-hand side, right-hand side from the day from the 1340s, by the way, would have been encountering um, paved roads probably for the first time. So again, it's kind of thinking about the difference between what a city represented in the medieval era compared to a largely agricultural country. It was still at that time a country of villages, agricultural villages, a place where people lived, worked, you know, uh, all their lives. But the thing that would bring them to the city would either be for market, if they were very successful, very wealthy, or more likely for pilgrimage. So the pilgrimage factory is the draw. That's what pulls people into cities. And so, so much of what you see in the cities was then built to cater for and provide for the um, the pilgrims. So much in the same way today, you've got hotels, Airbnbs, etc. Um, and accommodation providers as well as obviously the bars, restaurants, cafes. That's always been there because there's very, very heavy footfall. So all you know, throughout its history, you know, right the way back to kind of when the Romans arrived, you know, and it was all about, you know, providing, um, you know, a, you know, an hour and a half for soldiers that were coming back from, from, from a tough tour of Hadrian's Wall. It's always been about, you know, somewhere to, to rest up, good food, entertainment, drink, etc. So it's kind of shot through into York's kind of DNA and not more so than this kind of medieval era where the streets were thronged with pilgrims. 
that were coming for, of course, kind of religious enlightenment. But while they were here, they were looking to take in the riches of a city because cities just weren't something that people encountered on a regular basis. And of course, because people were coming here and they had money to spend, then of course, you know, all human life is here from entertainers to pickpockets to thieves, you name it, to the ladies of ill repute. Um, they're all going to kind of come. So this is um, the, the Praetorian Gate. This is kind of the end of the main route from the Romans, the river just behind the mansion house. Um, so this is that's where the old kind of river crossing was. So I think on here, yeah, I stopped and showed you the, the side chain, the Praetorian Gate. So like that. I'll, do, I'll do a Roman version of this tour one day. I'll take you to all the Roman bits of your... Um, but we are 10 minutes away from the hour being up. And I still got quite a long walk to Micklegate. And at this point, I was starting to think, I don't think I'm going to do this. I really don't think I'm going to do this. Um, so I thought, right, I'm going to change my route. I'm going to go down Blake Street. I'm going to cross the river. And we're going to do best. So I'm, I'm, I hope the volume isn't too loud in the background. I turn it down because by this is was huffing and puffing a bit. Um, I was uh, somewhat struggling. Um, but I was determined to see if I could do this in an hour. So in case you're wondering, if you can hear in the, in the background a, f a faint, sort of heavy breathing, or laboured breathing, should we put it that way, um, that is me, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, doing my best for no good reason uh, to, to try and hit all four gateways in our beautiful Judge's Lodgings pub. Not medieval, but lovely all the same. Um, so in front of us is the gardens, and of course at the bottom of the gardens is... St Mary's Abbey, and that of course was the focal point of many of the pilgrimages. Many would come and stay in the gardens, in the hospitium, if you remember the black and white building in the gardens. That was the kind of holiday in a place you could go, but you could stay actually in, in, in the gardens themselves. So again, this was an area where you'd be likely to be encountering a great number of, 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 of monks, people in monastic orders, orderlies, and so forth. So the whole thing would have very much a feel of a city under holy orders. And of course, the monastery was built in its location because it was by the river. Why by a river? Well, because, um, you know, the usual stuff, you need a supply of water, drinking, washing, you need to boil the water before you drink it. In fact, they made beer, actually. Very low alcohol beer because it was safer than drinking the water. But also things, you know, fishing, so a supply. But also deliveries, being able to look nice little gateway down to, to, the, to the, um, the Star of the City restaurant down there. So being by the water made sense. You would get deliveries through. Um, but because a lot of deliveries, so another way of arriving into the city was by the river, you need a way of controlling that. So we've seen how the city gates controlled it. Now we're talking about water gates. Um, because water gates were just as much a kind of part of control. So somebody's arriving by a boat. Well, how do you check their credentials? How do you get to pay the taxes? Well, it's easy. You create water gates. And two of them are here. So on the, the right-hand side, we've got Lendl Tower. On... The left hand side we've got the Barker Tower, now known as the Perky Peacock Cafe. And originally both would have been looked exactly like the, 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 the Barker Tower on the left hand side. Um, Lennel Tower has been kind of rebuilt. There would have been sort of pontoon and chains going through the water. So you'd be physically stopped. You wouldn't be able to pass through on a boat without paying your taxation and without having to demonstrate you know, your credentials, why we're here, what was your business in the city. So it's not simply land gates. It's water gates um, is another kind of form of kind of control. Um, and as we're kind of walking down now towards um, the station, we see um, the openings in the walls um, that were part of the trade-off. So when I said they decided that York needed to keep its walls, York's needs for modernity didn't, didn't entirely fall on deaf ears. It was said that what you can do is you can create some new archways in the walls, you might see one just coming up now on your right-hand side, to enable the flow of vehicles. Now, at this time, that would have been stagecoaches and, of course, trains rather than motor vehicles. But nonetheless, it was recognised that the walls were constraining. It did need to create these new gateways. But for the first time, you're creating unmanned gateways. You're just creating access points. So the whole point of a wall and a system of defences and gates that control and close was kind of thrown a bit up in the air because suddenly it was more important to allow things free passage in and out, a whole different sort of mentality and thinking about cities. But by this stage, don't forget, the threats had fallen over one country with, with, with Scotland, Napoleon being defeated, you know, Britain was, was not really kind of under major threat. So a kind of different kind of mindset, a different thought about what controlling and what gates are there to do. 
The first station, by the way, was actually within the city walls. So when the trains came first time round, um, I was getting really annoyed at this point because I'm like waiting for the for the crossing. I'm thinking I need to be in Micklegate five minutes from now, and this bloody lights won't change. So unfortunately, um, I, I I decided I was going to not take a dash for it, but I took a measured risk with those guys. We didn't wait for the green light, but uh, if I hadn't, I was falling way behind the schedule. So <laughs> needs must when you've got a timetable to keep. So. Uh, another archway through the wall. So we're seeing coming to the railway land of York now. So the the, the big uh, Grand Central Hotel, York's five star hotel. Um, but of course, this is um, this is the site of kind of the, the roads. So the the railways, if you like, disrupt the medieval idea of a city where getting in and out easily is more important than keeping people out. So it's a complete change of kind of mindset. And so the Victorians really kind of dispense with the idea of there's a city that's closed to creating a city that's open and welcoming we've got the old sort of station here on the right hand side now the kind of council offices um, all frightfully grand completely the wrong place though because the trains had to come in one way and reverse back out again so it didn't really work that location so soon enough they built the railways the train station on the other side of the walls so we're going to leave the walls behind we're going to head now towards micklegate we are a mere four minutes away from the hour um but still time i felt to just take in the majesty of the ground so little changed really i mean it is a five-star hotel but built as, as an office building just showing the wealth of the railways the transformative effect um and how what is fascinating is, is victorian engineering was really utilized to bring people to york who then could indulge in their medieval fantasies because York was seen as kind of unspoilt and uh, a nice Georgian house there you know kind of foreground nice 25 bedrooms if you got the money um so we're coming up now into Toft Green uh, this was a tannery moat this is where they make leather in the medieval period uh, always outside the city walls um you needed to be um to, to have fresh water but really smelly so Tanner's moat behind us was, 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 was by the river um, but as far away from people as possible because it really was stinking. The tanning and barker tower that we saw by the river on the gateways, they uh, they treated the bark because the tannins in bark was used to treat the hides, turning animal skin into leather. Apologies for any vegetarians on, but of course, you know, in the medieval period, that was you know very much uh, kind of in demand, as you might say. So all this area would have been lots of drying of of kind of leather skins. Um, we're going to take a dodge down into uh, the street. I can't think it was called now. Is it, Baxter Lane, Barker Lane, um, to get towards Micklegate. We are now two and a half minutes from the hour. And uh, to say my heart was beating is an understatement. It was absolutely thumping into my throat. But I started to think there's a possibility I'm going to do this. So, of course, we are coming into Micklegate. Micklegate, great. To so Micklegate, great street. Gate, garter from the Nordic, meaning street, highway. So Micklegate is the great street. So it's the main thoroughfare, and as many of you will be aware, it is the royal entrance to the city. So we're coming into Micklegate in just a moment. We're going to turn around to the right-hand side. We've got Holy uh, Trinity um, across the way from us, Jacob's Well. And so we're going to get a medieval church on there. So it's medieval church of monastic, um, as, as so many of them were. Um, so we're coming up now to the top of Micklegate with the gateway, and this was the main entrance to the city. So if you were a person of means, of prestige, you'd be approaching York from the south, probably coming from London or Southern England or from overseas. So you'd be approaching from the south side and the royal entrance, the main entrance of Micklegate, this was part of the priory by they belonged to the church built in the early part of the 15th century. So let out to clerics and, and they're studying become, to become clerics at the time. Um, so it's far away the grandest um, of the visitors. And still to this day, it's where the monarch comes to be greeted. So some of you may have joined me, King Charles, uh, we saw, and Queen Camilla at, oh, she was Queen Consort, then, actually, to tell the truth. Um, it's one minute to the hour, by the way. Um, we saw um, arrive just here. And, and traditionally, because of York's medieval charter that it got in 1296, York is independent from the monarch. It basically paid for its independence. And so a monarch must ask permission to enter into York. And tradition has it that on the first request, the Lord Mayor of York will say no. 
The Cynic Party, the Royal Party, have a little contretemps, and at the same time of asking, then permission is granted. And the sword is handed back from the monarch to the city. Um, and if you look at the city regalia, by the way, what they call the cap of maintenance, which is like a red felt cap, then that is um, uh, the, the, it, it represents York's independent self-rule. It is a mere 10 seconds to the hour. And here I was, I'd made it, Micklegate Bar. Um, I could barely speak by this point. <laughs> That's the hour there. So I think I, I, was, I was about 15 feet short, but I think you can kind of give that to me and say that that was a wholly good effort. We're still within a minute now. So that's the crest of King Henry VII. So Henry VII, we talked about earlier, the 1489 rebellion. He arrived in York in 1486, and he was greeted by rose petals fluttering down, red and white rose petals fluttering down from above. But he wasn't at all convinced because, of course, York had been a staunch ally of the Plantagenets, of Richard III. And, um, and so... He didn't believe for one moment that York had suddenly changed its course and set about, um, you know, clipping York's wings terribly. But what he did do, of course, is marry Elizabeth of York. Um, and so despite the fact that York um, suffered terribly, this end of the medieval period really was right at the end now. This 1489, this rebellion riots, it was all because York was doing so badly. His, his, his economy had crashed. The royal family didn't give a stuff about it. They thought that York was treacherous, duplicitous, couldn't be trusted. Its wings had been clipped. It had been taxed to high heaven. The money had gone. The prestige had gone. The place was falling down. And so that was York at the end of the medieval period. So different from the high years, if you like, of the medieval period. Um, but of course it continued as the major centre of the north, the second city of England. Although from an economic point of view, that was kind of going to fall away. But York still stands as officially the kind of ceremonial second city. Of course, the monarch's second child is the Duke of York and has been for centuries. Okay, if there were five lines crest and the royal standard next to one another. So York is, is really kind of positioned as this royal city and that is very much established in the medieval era. So I hope that in this kind of flavour, I've given you a bit of an overview of York thinking about gateways, access, control, who you let in, who you keep out, why people might kind of visit, um, and kind of what the city vibe was about. And I did it in an hour, which I think is is quite remarkable. I can't believe I did that. I couldn't have done it talking probably because I've been too out of breath. But it does show you actually how small York really is. So if you're thinking about visiting, do, do, do come and see us because it really is small enough. Take a few days out, Leslie did, and you've got so much time to play with and so much else to kind of see sort of beyond so i do hope you've enjoyed um that video that is uh on the end so let's just quickly cut back to me and uh go phew out of breath all over again um that was an hour um but i hope that you felt that you saw some of york that would not seen before um which is the point right um i'm, I'm not trying to just kind of show you the same stuff over and over, although of course, inevitably one runs out of, 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 of things that you can say. Um, hi Herbert, yes, we have been in the, in the bar comment. Do you think all York Unlocked, which we'll be doing again uh, next month. Um, and the bar comment, there's a video. If you follow me on YouTube, All Points North with John, you should be able to find, if you look up York Unlocked, you'll find the bar convent, and you see a 15 minute uh, video where I'm there um, with the, the uh, Sister Anne, who is, of course, the uh, the mother superior of, of... And she was a light. I can't remember those of you who it. How is Humphrey? Humphrey is, is fine. He's, he's doing better. You know, he's, he's now, what is he, 13, 12 weeks post-op. So every week gets better. We're upping his exercise. Um, you know, so he's, he's happier because obviously he's doing more. So, yeah, all good. Yeah, um, thank you to everybody that, 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 you know, really helped. It, it made a huge difference. And, you know, he's a different dog. I mean, again... Go, go on, if you haven't seen it, uh, A Walk With Humphrey is um, is on my YouTube channel, All Points North with John. If you haven't subscribed, do do so. Do like and do nice things with the videos. Um, but there's a thing called A Walk With Humphrey, and I talk all about, you know, obviously what happened in his recovery and, and so forth. And you can see him, and, that, and that's the main thing, because people wanted to see him, of course. So um, I, I kind of did that and thought that was kind of a good way to do it. So um, with that, you can see I'm itching. I want to have a shower today, but um, I, I kind of ran out of time. I've been decorating. Um, so 
thank you. Thank you, everybody who's joined. Thank you, Elizabeth, for that lovely contribution. Thank you, everybody else, for making contributions in however you see fit. Uh, and if you're not able to do this time, don't worry, I know you will when you can. Um, so it's been lovely to have you join us. And I'm next on, I think on Sunday, uh, a place called Hooton Pagnell, a beautiful village. Um, and you know I love doing pretty villages. So if you if you enjoy my pretty village tours, um, Fort of the Dale, etc., um, come on this one, because it's a real doozy. You're going to like this one. You won't have heard of it. Um, but that's that's nice. You won't know what to expect. Um, you'll love it. So do come with me on Sunday, and um, I look forward to it. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I shall see you all very very soon. And uh, thanks for continuing to support what we do. It is most appreciated. So uh, thank you, and and good night.